It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr Pam Lynch. I saw her speak middle of last year and I was very lucky that Louise Little from Joondalup gave me her contact details. Without the contact details, you can't find anyone. It's really important. But Pam's going to talk to us about those, the Orkneys, those windy, mysterious, isolated islands. And the Neolithic history will raise questions and maybe leave some more open. So I'm going to hand over to Pam, who knows all. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Um, but thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming along this afternoon. Um, now, I've called this walking through history um, because I, you know, I firmly believe that whenever we walk through any place, we are, we are affected, we're embraced by the history of that place and the history of the land that we're walking across. Because without that history, making the place and ourselves who and what we are today, um, we would be very different people walking in very different places. Uh, let's face it, you know, we walk along these lands there or even just outside here in the, in the Perth Cultural Centre. We are walking along the same land that people thousands upon thousands of years walked along, the same land. We're looking up at the same stars, the same sky. Okay, a few stars may have come and gone in the meantime, but we're basically looking up at the same thing that people thousands of years ago would have looked upon. So our history and our ancient history in particular has formed that, that bedrock, that foundation upon which we have um, emerged. So that's my, my passion for history. The older the better, and when it comes to the Orkney Islands, we've got some significantly old stuff there, as I'll point out. Um, so I will start now, and as I say, I'll keep my eye on the time, but I'm sure nobody's got to rush off dead on, on three o'clock. So where are the Orkney Islands? For anybody who doesn't know, they are um, off the north coast of Scotland. They are between Scotland and Norway, basically and they comprise of 70 islands and skerries. Um, now, I had to look up skerries when I first saw that word. They're the small rocky islands that are uninhabitable, but 20 of the islands of the Orkneys are inhabited, um, and many are connected via uh, causeways, so you can drive between several of them. Others, you do have to take ferries. So we can see um, there the set of islands. So 16 kilometres north of mainland Scotland, 70 islands and skerries, 20 permanently inhabited. And that's, that's the setup. You can see um, what is called mainland is um, the, the biggest of, um, of the islands. However, there's some others that are significant, of a significant size and they are inhabited. They have industry, they have tourism um, and all of that sort of thing going on. Now, I will start with a little bit of um, natural history, because to me that's all part of, of history. Um, and just one specific place that, that I went to, I was in the Orkneys three, just over three years ago now, 2018. Um, I did have plans to be back there last year. I have plans to be back there next year. Um, watch this space. So, and I do know there's a group of, of ladies here who are planning um, a trip to the Orkneys as well in a couple of years' time. So, um, let's all keep our fingers crossed. So, the Old Man of Hoy is a sea stack. Now, it is um, 137 metres high, this sea stack. It's made of red sandstone and it was created after 1750. Um, and we know that because of early maps and drawings. Um, and if we see here, that on the left there is an early uh, drawing of the Old Man of Hoy, um, where it had, you can see why it was called the Old Man, because it's got the two legs there. Um, and that was the early 19th century. One of those legs washed away. The top part, as you can see, was 
well, it wasn't washed away, but it fell off. Um, and we're left with that sea stack, which is separated from the mainland. Now, you can imagine that was connected at one point, totally connected. You can imagine how many hundreds of thousand millions of years that has taken to wash away and create that sea stack there. It's not the only one, there's quite a few of them in the, um, around the coast of the United Kingdom in general, um, but this is quite a significant one. Now, the day we were there, you take a ferry across to, um, from the mainland to the island of Hoi, um, you walk for about, I wanna say about an hour or so up to this point. That left-hand photo is what we saw when we got there. And we thought, right. <laughs> Um, we had plenty of time before we had to get the ferry back. We'd taken snacks and lunch and that. So we just perched ourselves on that nice grassy um, cliff top and gradually that mist disappeared and it emerged. And we were looking almost, we were almost level with, with the top. So looking down and it was quite mesmerising and it came and went um, a couple of times uh, during the time we were up there. But it's not only um, a beautiful thing to see, there are people that climb these things. <laughs> I will walk as far as you like. I ain't climbing anything like that. Uh, but yes, it was first climbed um, in 1966 by Chris Bonington. Um, and the youngest climber was eight years old. Um, and yeah, they, you know, climb to the top. And there's also this interesting guy here who decided it might be fun to just tightrope walk across it. Um, so, you know, history notwithstanding, these things um, can be used for several purposes. Now, what we're going to look at um, in greater detail is the Neolithic period. Now, this is what it means. Neo is new, lithic is stone. So basically, the new Stone Age. Uh, in, um, it, it generally, is it, it encompasses that 10,000 BC to 2,000 BC. Um, but when we're talking about Neolithic Orkney, we're talking 3,500 BC to 2,000 BC is what uh, we generally look at when we're talking about the Orkneys. And it was that period of, of transition from hunter-gatherers to civilization. So prior to, to the Neolithic period, uh, man had been, they'd been hunter-gatherers, which meant that we were nomadic. Um, the hunter-gatherers would set, well, not even settle, but wander, basically, uh, throughout a, an area, sometimes a very extended area. Uh, they would forage, they would, you know, feed themselves on what they could and uh, hunting and gathering, basically, that self-explanatory. But at some point, for some reason, they gave up that nomadic lifestyle and for some reason decided to settle. Uh, now, this didn't just happen in the Orkneys. This was happening all over the world, independently of each other. So, you know, you have to wonder what it was at that period of time uh, that they decided to settle down. It was at the time of, you know, agriculture, they started planting crops and um, developing the animals for food and, uh, and leather and all of that sort of thing. There was buildings, settlements. We see the beginning of writing in various forms, obviously not a writing that is legible to us today, um, unless we've been able to decipher it, but things like weaving and pottery making. Um, so it's that settlement. Now, this didn't happen overnight over 100 years, over 200 years. It happened gradually, over thousands of years. And as I say, why? Why did man suddenly, well, not suddenly, but why did they decide that they wanted to settle in one place and create dwellings, give themselves permanent shelter, and, and these, I guess, in their day, creature comforts? Um, there have been ideas put forward as in, was it some form of climate change, you know, Climate change is certainly not a, a, new, a new thing. Um, was it advances in the human brain? And this is what interests me the most, is how our brains, even now, are constantly developing. 
Um, you know, all of us are constantly developing our brains to say nothing of the youngsters who are coming through with a brain more like a machine in a lot of cases, you know. We've all got grandchildren who could walk all over us when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, was it advances in the human brain um, that made um, people start to settle um, and do this? So, when we're looking at Neolithic Orkney, now up at the top there are just some of the sites on Neolithic Orkney. With, if you take a line down, you can see the dates, um, the times that, that the archaeologists have dated these constructions too. The oldest of them, the Nap of Hauer, takes us, what, between 3,500 BC and 3,750 BC. Um, one of the main ones, Scara Bray, that, you know, a lot of people know about Scara Bray. Even that was created around 3,000 BC. The earliest one we have on there is the Ring of Brodger, which was over 2005, prior to 2500 BC. Now, when you look at world constructions, we've got the Pyramid of Giza, which was around the same time as the Ring of Brodger. We've got Stonehenge around that time too. So the Orkney Islands had these things prior to some of the very well-known um, archaeological discoveries um, in the rest of the world. And it, it's interesting, the Orkney Islands, uh, you know, excavation has been relatively recent um, on the Orkney Islands, as opposed to, um, you know, in the rest of Europe, where, uh, you know, we've got the early archaeologists from the 17th and 18th centuries um, right the way through, whereas the Orkneys, not so much. Our discoveries have been made um, relatively recently, so in the last, you know, less than 100 years, probably 50-odd years. So again, I'm going to put this up here and point out that if you take a line, whoo, I've got a pointer, from the tip of Scotland there, that part there, whoo, uh, encompassing those, and then again from here, encompassing that, you can see that at one point in the dim distant past, Norway was connected to Scotland. It was one land mass. Um, it gradually, over, you know, with um, the sea levels constantly changing, um, it, it separated and uh, the islands were created. Now, the interesting thing that is that the Orkneys are part of Scotland. However, they weren't always that way. Up until 1472, the Orkney Islands and the Shetland Islands were part of Norway. And then in 1472, Princess Margaret of Norway was marrying King James III of Scotland and the Orkney Islands and the Shetlands were given um, as surety for her dowry of 50,000 florins. Um, now, the idea was that the 50,000 florins would be paid to the King of Scotland and he'd hand back the islands. After two years, he hadn't got that money. So, an Act of Parliament made the Orkneys and the Shetland Islands part of Scotland. And they've been part of Scotland ever since. So, if things had gone differently, they could all have been speaking Norwegian on the Orkney Islands. Um, just a, an intriguing, again, part of history which has changed completely um, t the time after that. Now, what we have on the Orkney Islands is what is called the heart of Neolithic Orkney. And it was created a World Heritage Site in 1999. Now, you know, we've heard of a lot of different World Heritage Sites. Um, this one encompassed four specific sites. Maze Howe, which is a, believed to be a tomb. Um, the Standing Stones of Stennis. The Ring of Brodga, uh, which they are both um, circular rings of stone. And Scara Bray, which is a settlement site. So this is just a map with most, I'm not going to say all, but most of the Neolithic sites encompassing the Orkney Islands. Um, so you can see there's, it, they're all the way over. It's not one specific spot. However, Neolithic Orkney, the World Heritage Site, is basically centred on the mainland, um, round here, I think it is. There we are, that's a, that's a better view of it. So this here, so you've got the Ring of Brodga here, you've got the Standing Stones of Stennis here, 
and you've got Maze Howe there. Scarabray is slight distance away, but still within the same general area. A uh, couple of maps um, over the other side, so you can just put it in a little bit of, of context. We've just, you know, um, zoomed in on it there, so to speak. Now, the Ness of Brodga is intriguing. It's not included, if you remember, on that list of World Heritage Site, simply because it hadn't been discovered in 1999. It's a much more recent discovery. And because the World Heritage Site um, had been created, shall we say, they thought that, okay, well, we need to do a bit of a survey on the rest of that area. Um, the area that they found the Ness of Brodga, they thought it was just a, you know, a slight mound, that there was nothing there. They took their um, geophysical equipment across it and basically it went mad. Um, all sorts of things were popping up on this um, equipment. Um, so they thought, okay, well, we'd better have a look. And uh, this is what they found. And this is only, um, they, they discovered it in, let me just flick that over. Um, so sorry, that it is um, in the middle there. So this is the area where this has been discovered. So they were surveying this section here just to clarify that there was nothing there, um, when in reality there was. Um, so the Ness of Brodga, that is what, more or less what it looks like today. I didn't take the photo and I do have to acknowledge I got it off their Facebook page, but it gives you a good overview of it. Um, so it's a peninsula of land between these two locks. Um, now, when we look at that photo, we also have to bear in mind, again, this, you know, the global warming and the difference um, of the, the water levels. Um, during the period that this um, area was um, in use, it would have been very marshy there. Um, the water levels would have been lower and there would have been a lot of marshes and reeds and that sort of thing around it. Um, so it was discovered in 2003, as I say, when they, they surveyed that area. Um, and in 2004, excavations began and they've been ongoing every year since. I think they got... Um, a bit of a dig in last year because I think Britain and Scotland had sort of come out of their main lockdown, the first lockdown then. So I think they got a bit in and I do know they got a dig in this year. Um, sadly, I was there in May and because of the climate on the Orkney Islands, they only excavate in Ju July and August. Um, so when I do go back, I've got to plan it a little bit better um, this time. So yes, I do think they did get a dig in this year. But you can imagine only digging for two months each year how long it's, it's going to take them because it's much more extensive than they have found there. And as I said, it was surrounded by marsh level, marshland, and it's in the middle of a natural amphitheatre. So the land on the other side of the locks creates a sort of an, an amphitheatre um, for it. Again, that's where it is. Um, bombarding you with, with maps, um, but yeah, it's just in there. So the land on either side here um, creates this natural, natural amphitheatre. Now, that's the excavation up there that they're doing. This is a reconstruction that they've created here. Um, now, before I go on any further, I am going to read to you. Um, this is from an article. And it, they can, this, can, this can say it much better than I can and get all the facts straight. So I'm just going to give you a little bit here. Bit here. Um, so what they have, this um, particular person has said, it, it's not just the dimensions that, that surprised and delighted the archaeologists, um, but their excavations revealed that hematite-based pigments have been used to paint the external walls. Um, it said they've never seen anything like it before. The density of the archaeology, the scale of the buildings and the skill that was used to construct them are simply phenomenal. There are very few dry stone walls on Orkney today that could match the ones they have uncovered there. Yet they are more than 5,000 years old in places, still standing a couple of metres high. This was a place that was meant to impress and it still does. Um, now, as you can see, it's got wall all the way around it um, with the, uh, an opening there and an opening there. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. Um, but it's not believed to be 
a settlement. They haven't found um, the settlement um, and it, things that you would normally find on a settlement site. Uh, they have found, they believe it was used for ritual purposes. Now, dealing with any form of archaeology, um, there is nobody going to be able to stand up there and say, oh, this was used for that. It's all assumption, analysis, and educated guesses, more, sometimes more educated than others, because you've got to bear in mind that this is basically prehistory. We have no written records for any of this. So we can only make assumptions based on, um, you know, other sites that may have been discovered and, okay, so they were very similar, why? Um, but going back this distance and finding it in this condition, it's very hard to find a comparison. But um, the flagstone that they used here, it's easily split into those flat stones. There was an abundant supply um, of that sort of um, the flagstone uh, around, um, around the Orkneys. Um, and it was found to be used for the walls, the floors, and quite possibly the roofs. And as I said, reading out of that, they've also found pigment that indicates that um, it was painted as well. Um, now, we don't know what the site was used for. Um, it's believed to be ceremonial or ritual, uh, but we do know that around 2.5 to 2, 2 BC, there was a ceremonial demolition of structure 10. Uh, they named each of the structures with a number. Now, they found that the, around 400 cattle had been slaughtered. That's a lot of cattle when you look at um, the importance of um, cattle in that sort of um, society, if you like. Um, now, the tibias of those cattle had been laid around that structure and an upturned cow skull was placed within it the tibias appear to have been cracked and the marrow extracted. Now, that is taken to indicate a feast because we have other periods of history where we know where we've got maybe a bit of written history, Roman period, for instance, where we do know that um, things like this do indicate a feast. Um, they would extract the marrow and eat the marrow. They probably maybe cooked some of the. Um, the meat from the cows and used that. There was also the carcasses of red deer placed on top of the bones. And then structure 10 was lar largely destroyed. And that appears to mark the closure and the abandonment of that site. Now, the archeologists, you know, that it's just so, it's very overwhelming because they're finding so much and they're having to make these judgment calls about what they think. Um, the, this this um, site was used for, but as I said, they found nothing that would indicate settlement because settlement sites have specific things you're looking for, like you know p broken pottery and uh, middens, sort of dump sites where you find um, household rubbish, like, just like you do today. Um, and they found no evidence of a of settlement, so they do believe it was some form of ritual um, site. Now. This is all going to come together in a minute, trust me. Um, but we've got, also got standing stones. So we've got the standing stones there, the Ring of Brodga, and we've got the standing stones of Stennis there, and bearing in mind the Ness of Brodga is just there. Um, now, they are, you do have slightly... So that is what they are looking like at the moment. Now, the um, standing stones, the Ring of Brodga, which is the one on the left there, now, it's a perfect circle. It was built to a perfect circle, 103.7 metres in diameter, and the stones were approximately six degrees apart. Um, originally, probably 60 stones, and there are still 27 um, remaining, um, and they... Um, differ from between 2.1 and 4.7 metres high, these ones that are still standing. And you can actually just go up there and you can wander around them. There's no admission fee or anything like that. Um, 
pick your time because I think tour buses and that pull up there. Um, but as I say, we went in May and it was relatively quiet, um, but you can just wander around them. And it, you know, the sheer size of them is quite um, overwhelming. I can stand here, you can look at the photo and I can say this is the size they were. Um, but when you're thinking, you know, some of them are still standing to over four metres, that's, you know, up there somewhere basically. <laughs> Um, so they are, you know, they've withstood the test of time, basically. Um, now, as with any of these stone circles, you know, Stonehenge being the, the big one, where did this stone come from and how did they get it here? Um, it's a case of how long is a piece of string. Uh, there was um, the, the likely sources at Sandwick, which was about five miles away, because they have found some sort of half-carved ones still there, laid down on the ground. Um, and as with Stonehenge, the you know, theories um, abound as to how they transported them. But there was one very good um, reenactment. Now, there's um, Neil Oliver has done a really good set of um, documentaries um, on uh, the ancient Orkneys, on these sites. I found it on um, Vimeo last year sometime, so you might find it if you try and research it. Um, but they did a reenactment using seaweed and it worked so well because the seaweed is slippery and slimy and basically like instead of putting rollers under the stones and you know constantly, they used the, and it, it really worked very well. Just another theory, obviously, but there was an abundant supply of seaweed. Um, I guess the ocean is closer than it is with a lot of the standing stones, so they may have, they may have done that. Um, now, there were less uh, stones with the uh, standing stones of Stennis. Um, have I got them here? You see just the few there. Um, but they were all the same in that they were all aligned and as with Stonehenge and as with um, quite a few other buildings, they were aligned with, you know, the solstice um, and that. And I think, have I got the photo? That's an, just an old one showing that, you know, there were more stones there um, in that historical period and so some of those have, um, have dropped down. But there you go. I think that's called the watch stone um, and it is aligned um, to the solstice. So... You know, you, we've got to question, um, I'm not going to say their intelligence because they were obviously intelligent, but they obviously understood things that, that we don't as a group. Uh, you know, the geometry that would have been required to get that all very accurate, um, to say nothing of, you know, the knowledge of celestial bodies and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, the chances are that they had a, an oral storytelling tradition like we know that many other ancient um, cultures had. The Greeks were famous for it. Um, so they may have had this oral tradition where, you know, there was the wise man who handed his, um, his knowledge down to the next generation. Um, but, you know, we, we, we don't know what these circles were used for, you know, fertility rites, family <laughs> gatherings. We, we just simply do not know. Um, but this is where we come to trying to put it all together. So if you look at the map again, we've got the Ring of Brodga standing stones, we've got the Ness of Brodga there, and we've got the other standing stones of Stennis there. So we've got standing stones, ritual site, standing stones, entrance out of each side. So does some ritual, some ceremony go on in one of them and they enter there? another ceremony and out they go that side. Is there ceremonies in each one? Are they family groups? Are they gender groups? Are they age groups? Does something, you know, are, are there some rituals and then they need to go in here and some other rituals? It could be marriages, you know, marriages, births, deaths. Um, it could simply be um, the weekly market or, you know, that sort of thing. We, we can come up with all sorts of highfalutin ritual, you know, ideas, but it could be something as simple as the market. Um, but this area here is significant and um, the excavation is still very much ongoing. Um, so they, they're gradually discovering more and more. And of course, although I say they only excavate for um, those 
two months a year. The rest of the year, there, there's a lot of analysis um, going on and reconstructions and, and you know, that sort of thing. Um, we may come up with some form of answer eventually, um, but I think most of it will be um, assumptions. Um, but fascinating stuff all the same. I am expecting you all um, to go home tonight and be, not be able to sleep because you're going to be thinking on this. And I would like your ideas, you know, as well, when you've, when you've sorted it out for me. I would quite like your ideas on what, um, what, these, um, what these sites were used for. Uh, as I say, it's a bit like a piece of string, really. Now, one of the other sites in um, that group um, was Maze Howe. Uh, now, this is a chambered cairn, um, and this is how it looks today. So it's still very significant on the landscape. It's, it's obvious, you can't miss it. Um, now this was established around 2800 BC and it is unique to Orkney, this one, but it's a significant monument, obviously. It, its dimensions are 35 metres across, 7.3 metres high in the centre there, so significant. And this is what it looks like inside. So you've got a long, narrow entrance passage, and then you've got a central chamber here with cells off either side. Now, we spoke about them being um, sort of intelligent people and very, um, they knew what they were doing basically. And this clarifies that even more because these walls were made of solid stone slabs. Um, the corner posts here, were solid stone. Um, and as I just said, you know, how high did I say it was? That, the significant. So again, moving these things, apart from uh, creating them, um, you know, because they were all very precise, the measurements. Um, so very, very um, intelligent people uh, when it comes to, to this. Um, I'm just going to point out where this is. So Maze Howe is here. So it's still in that same sort of area. So again, does it have some significance um, to that? Um, now, I will just go back a bit and just point out that, that it's believed to be a tomb, but we have no, um, no remains there. And it was um, robbed um, during the Viking period and that sort of thing, which I'll say more about later, um, which is what happens to a lot of these archaeological sites, particularly tombs um, throughout the entire world. Um, you find that during the years, particularly during you know, um, the Middle Ages and, and prior to that, they've been robbed. Um, people have got in there because they knew there were tombs and they knew that um, you know, high to do people were often buried with belongings and that. So, um, so we've lost a lot of... of evidence um, when it comes to that. So moving on, um, we'll now look at basically life itself in, in Neolithic Orkney and Scarabray, which probably a lot of you have heard of Scarabray. It's a very um, well-known um, Neolithic settlement site. Uh, and when I say well-known, it's well-known throughout Europe, throughout the world. It's one of the best um, that there is. Um, now, it was founded in round about 3,200 BC, so we're talking 5,000 years ago. And again, let's question their ability to do this when we're thinking they are just, you know, a society that, um, you know, scavengers and that sort of thing. It was settled for a few generations, then it was abandoned for around a century, and then there was a second phase of occupation around 2800 BC for another two to three centuries. It was abandoned again finally um, because the sea and the sand was encroaching and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, but it, that encroaching of the sand, basically it covered it, um, preserved it brilliantly for over four and a half thousand years and we can come along, dig it out basically and discover all this um, that's down there. Um, but when, you know, I say it was settled on a specific time and it was, you know, used and then abandoned and then used again, um, as archaeologists they can, they can identify this from, from remains, from the remains of fire and that sort of thing, um, from the different soil that they find in the levels. Um, and you can tell if a, um, if a settlement or part of a settlement has just been, all the rubbish has been dumped in it. Um, so it's, it's 
dateable, shall we put it that way. Um, it was discovered in the 1860s. Now I'm going to compete here. Um, it was discovered in the 1860s and four of the huts were excavated. Um, so they excavated all in all, um, eventually, um, 13 stone buildings and there were originally more that have fallen into the sea or been lost to the sea. So in the late 1920s, a sea wall was built and the rest of the, uh, a lot more excavation was undertaken. And as I say, it was well preserved by Sam. So this is what it looks like today. So you can see what I mean when I say, you know, the sand just mounded up on the top. Um, however, they did some of the mounding up themselves, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but you can see very clearly um, the, uh, the different areas, the different sites there. Um, and there's some more, so you've got, this is, would have been one, and we assume it was um, specific families in each of these circular um, structures. Now that's a good map here, so you can see. So you're looking at the circular structures and they were all connected by this walkway. So you can see the main walkway going through the centre there and then the walkways off to the individual um, houses, if you like. Um, and this walkway was covered um, for protection and, and, as I say, intentionally covered. It wasn't just over time that the, the sand had blown over there. So it was intentionally covered um, by what's called a midden. So refuse, ashes, shells, bones, sand. It was all piled up there. It probably was piled up over time. Who knows, maybe that's where they dumped all their, their refuse. Um, but it would have had the effect, as we can imagine, uh, of really good insulation. Um, because it was a very cold place. The winds there um, would have been really quite horrendous. They were on, um, right on the ocean. Um, now, each house was four to six square metres. It had beds. So these here were beds. They would have put straw and that sort of thing, leather hides on there. Um, dresses there, cupboards. Uh, and this here was a fire pit. Now, they haven't rebuilt these. That's how they found them. There is a, a reconstruction of one of these in the visitor centre, but this is how they were. This is how they were found. Um, the beds apparently were earlier recessed into walls, but later they were freestanding. And they had a system of stone-lined drains for rainwater and waste, um, a small doorway into that passage, and a damp course. <coughs> Um, which was a layer of blue clay in the foundations. So, you know, all of this was lost after this period. Um, and, we, you know, we have to, again, there's so many questions. Let's, let's not even go there. Um, so this is, again, this is today, what they are today. Um, this is one of the walkways. This is another one of the rooms. So you get a really good idea at the height of the walls and that sort of thing. Um, now... It's too dry for any artefacts to have survived um, because of obviously the weather and, and the, um, the sand and that. There's, there's no um, artefacts surviving. Um, they have found what would have been driftwood from America. They've been able to identify the type of wood um, which would have been driftwood they would have picked up. They would have used sheepskins and leather. There is evidence of cattle, pigs and sheep. Um, they grew barley and wheat. Um, this sort of thing you can find, seeds and that sort of thing, still left in the ground. Um, and they would have fished, caught shellfish and, and probably small birds as well. So their lifestyle um, would have been quite, you know, um, quite significant. Um, they've been able to establish this um, independent lifestyle for themselves. So that's where it is. Now I've put that photo there. That's Kim that went with me. I'm sure she won't mind me showing her. Um, but that is the beach just by Scarabray there. So you can see the amount of stone that there is there. This is the beach. It was a beautiful beach and a beautiful day that we were there. Um, but this is how close you are. So you can see that there. So they built this sea wall in the 1920s to hold it back. But you can see how easy it would be for that to slip if there was no sea wall there, as we know, um, along the coast of a lot of countries, um, this, this happens because our coastline changes so dramatically. Um, now, this is um, another 
excellent site that I really liked because my fascination is for burials, but we'll not go there. Um, <laughs> um, but it's called the Tomb of the Eagles. Um, now, it was found, uh, discovered in 1958 by Ronnie Simison on his land, and he was looking for some suitable rocks. He was building a, um, a wall um, on part of his property and he was looking for it. Um, and he and his wife, Morgan, after the discovery, they dedicated their lives to the site and he was an awarded an MBE in 2008 and I'll tell you more about him in a second. Um, but it's one of the, I want to say, nicest visitor experiences I've had in that it wasn't a big modern visitor centre. Um, it was relatively small. It is still run by members of their family on the land there. Um, and it's got... It's got lots of different experiences. This is one of the sites that I've been to where you can actually touch what they found. Um, now, as I say, he was looking for fencing um, and erosion exposed the sec section of horizontal stones, but he found several artefacts, artifacts, the mace, head, axe head, limestone knife, and a bead or button. You can still touch that button or bead whatever it was. Um, whereas most places you go, you can look at through, through a glass cage, but they're preserving them. Now, obviously, some artefacts are preserved, but they have things, you can, you can actually see one of the skulls that they found there. Um, so it, it's not posh and fancy, but it tells you the whole history. Um, so he discovered it. Um, he investigated a bit further and found a small chamber. And in that chamber, he found 30 human skulls 5,000-year-old Neolithic tomb, it turned out to be, and as well as the human skulls, there were talons of seven bones of sea eagles. I think that's meant to be talons and bones. I think my typing <laughs> hit the wrong button there. Um, so, again, okay, what is this, he thinks. Now, that's where it was, uh, and that's what he would have found, something like that. And that is where it is which in itself is believed to have some significance um, to it. Um, so, as I say, he um, discovered this and then for 20 years he did nothing, that no more excavation happened. But he immersed himself in the world of archaeology. He got to know archaeologists, he learnt all about archaeology, he learnt some techniques. And 20 years later, in 1976, um, he got a team of archaeologists in there and they excavated the whole thing. And they found 16,000 bones, almost 100 skulls, um, which is the largest collection of Neolithic bones found in the British Isles. Quite remarkable. Um, you can still get in there today. Obviously, they've taken all the bones out. That's how you get in, on a pulley, like that. Now, the entrance is three metres long. It's only 85 centimetres high. So, um, and 70 centimetres wide. So, you, you know, it's, it's narrow, it's small. Getting in there is a, is a struggle. Um, but when you do get in there, again, like the Mace How tomb, it was meticulously built, divided into sections. Um, again, a lion to the rising sun. Um, and it was built about five, over 5,000 years ago. Um, and then at some point, the roof was removed and the main chamber was filled with rubble. That's what it um, looked like. So again, you've got your side chambers and that sort of thing. That's the slight difference between the two, between Mays Howe and um, the Tomb of the Eagles. Again, differences, questions. I am moving on a little bit here because I think we're going to run out of time and I've only, I haven't got halfway. Um, so again, who were these people? What happened? Um, was it a whole settlement or selected individuals that were buried there? What were the ceremonies? Um, the bodies may have been excarnated, so left outside, um, and then the bones collected. Um, but what we do get is that the society was highly organised, with resources beyond that subsistence living. Take that thought away with you and come back with some more answers. Um, the Romans in Orkney, we don't believe they did land in Orkney. Um, generally, if the Romans settled anywhere, we've got lots of evidence and we haven't with the Romans. Um, it's, it's mentioned slightly, um, but again, that's probably just um, political 
you know, propaganda. Um, so we don't believe the Romans actually settled in the Orkneys. The Vikings were there. Um, again, sparse literary evidence, uh, very little physical evidence. We do have place names. Um, and in the mid 12th century, we know they broke into Maysow um, because they left evidence of these carved runes um, on the walls. Now, these runes were used for short notes only because they were an oral society. So their long stories were spoken. Um, but short things, uh, they wrote that. And these are some of the things that they wrote. <laughs> um, the necklace I do have on me today. Um, but they're using this history for um, jewellery and that sort of thing these days. So it's helping the modern day um, people that live here. But they you know, I just love Hermund of the Hardax, carve these runes, you know. Do we want to meet Hermund of the Hardax? I don't think so. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so this is um, what it would have, this, this particular piece of jewellery would have looked like on the walls of Mace Howe. We do know, thanks to Jean, because she forwarded me a, an article in a, a magazine, uh, that they have recently found evidence of the Vikings um, building a canal on Orkney. So this is just an indication that whatever we find now and say about now, it could change next year, 10 years' time, 50 years' time, because we're continually uh, discovering new things. Um, Scarpa Flow, which is in the centre of the group of islands, has been very, uh, been used a lot over the years. We use it as a Viking anchorage um, for anchoring the Viking fleet. And it was used, as, as some of you possibly are very much aware, in World War I and II. Um, that's what Scarpa Flow is, the body of water there, um, surrounded by the islands, that's what it looks like today. Now, World War I, um, Scarpa Flow was chosen as the main base for the British Grand Fleet. Um, block ships were sunk in the entrance channels to prevent the Germans' uh, U-boats coming through. Um, there were two attempts by the Germans to get their U-boats into the harbour. Both were unsuccessful. And at the end of the war, um, 74 ships of the Imperial German Navy's high seas fleet were interned at Scarpa Flow. Um, owing to a miscommunication, uh, the German commander of that fleet scuttled those ships. Um, they, the Royal Navy managed to beach some of them, uh, but 53 of those were totally scuttled, and they are still down there today. Um, that's just um, an impression of them. Uh, World War II, again, it was selected as the naval base. Uh, but many of the defences had, had fallen into disrepair. And sadly, um, the um, powers that be didn't understand the urgency of doing something about it until the uh, Germans attacked and sank the Royal Oak in Scarpa Flow um, and 833 lives were lost. Um, it is now a war grave, um, an official war grave. So more uh, blockades were put in their block ships and then Churchill ordered that the causeways, uh, so the Churchill barriers, were built to block um, the approaches to Scarpa Flow. Um, it took four years to build that and was officially opened four days after the end of the war. <laughs> However, um, it's been very useful right up until today because it's a, it's, it connects the islands and we've got nice roadways across those, those Churchill barriers uh, now so that you can, you can get through um, the, um, the islands. Just a couple of the, uh, the photos there. Um, also, they built um, defence batteries on, on the land. Um, Orkney was never invaded, but it has since the war provided a good training ground for many regiments and there's still um, the remains of those batteries. Um, and that's, they created the Lioness defensive perimeter um, because they were very, very worried that the Germans were going to paratroop in behind, um, behind them. Uh, that's the Royal Oak, which sadly um, so many people lost their lives on. Um, just what the, the Churchill barriers look like today. Um, current day, when we talk about Scarpa Flow, apparently, I haven't researched this, but it is the transfer and processing point for the North Sea oil. Tourism is a big thing, um, both the archaeology on the island, but also divers. It's a superb 
dive site um, for the, the ships that are still down there. And diving is permitted apart from the war grave site, um, but obviously no artifacts um, are allowed to be removed. Um, and you can see just from this aerial shot that you can still see um, these ships under the water there. So for any divers, um, it's an absolute haven um, down there. Um, it was built, um, the Churchill barriers were built by the Italian prisoners of war. Now, the Geneva Convention said you weren't allowed to use prisoners of war for war efforts, I think. So they used them under the guise of uh, improving communication. Um, but the, the Italians built their own uh, Italian chapel there as well. Um, and that you can still go and see today um, by the Churchill barriers there. Um, just another dive site there. That's what they look like, um, as I say, still there. And that's why it's such a vast history, as you can see here. So, you know, we start with the Neolithic over this side, um, you know, through the Vikings, through to, to the World War. So, you know, I mean, these are major topics in themselves. Each one of these things that I've spoken about um, is a major topic in itself. So I hope that you've got at least a bit of an overview. And for those of you that are going in a couple of years' time, I hope you um, have the weather that we had, which was absolutely stunning, um, and that you get to see um, some of these sites because it really is an awesome place to be. So thank you very much, people.